Hello, folks. Well, you know, first, let me tell you about Bud Period. Um, Bud's the designer of this rocket. He's also a longtime friend and was a member of the Capistrano Aero Dump Masters RC Special Effects team in Southern California when I was the president. Well, I met Bud when he was working as a graphics artist and an engineer at Rockwell International in Southern California. He had a lot to do with the shuttles, actually, and was also designing his own model shuttles complete with RC transporters. Well, Bud's always imagineering, and the RC model shuttle he built and we demonstrated years ago was a pretty big hit wherever he took it. Well, he made history when he launched two miniature shuttles and the camera which ejected and actually shot a picture of the two miniature shuttles ejecting from the main body of his rocket. Quite impressive. Well, it doesn't stop there. You know, Bud invented and patented the Southern California Area Transit System that is an absolute ingenious way to use the space in between the freeway lanes for a non-stop overhead rail train that drops off cars and picks them off all without stopping with aircraft precision. Well sadly like others Bud became a victim of the shuttle shutdown and the stock market crash so he retired early. Well when I started putting rocket motors on things and launching them this year Bud started offering me more and more things to try it on and plenty of his ideas. Well you know come on I'm really an RC pilot not a rocketeer so I said you know Bud you should design your own rocket since you are the rocket man. Well, that's exactly what he did. So what I'm going to show you first is some of the clever mechanisms Bud designed into this rocket. Well, first of all, the rocket is a Dare Mega Max from Estes. There are six D12-0 rocket motors and one E9 main motor installed. The nose cone actually contains the Model X14 jet. You can see the fins sticking out the side. It has retractable wings. There is a main chute for the nose cone, one for the rocket main body, and one on the F-14. There's also an emergency onboard ignition set up as a backup for the main motor. This backup was important to Bud because he says if the main motor does not light with my igniter, the second one will fire from his 9-volt batteries when the spacer is pulled out from the contacts as the other six motors lift it off. Well, this will happen approximately one foot from the launch point. You know, it's very important for the main motor to light because it not only provides incredible thrust, its reverse burn will burn through the burn cord in the middle of the rocket body, releasing the linchpins on the nose cone. The nose cone will then pop open and the F-14 will be pulled out. Well, the F-14 has folding retractable wings that are going to snap open and it's going to fly somewhere. I'm using my own ignition system with a 12 volt 15 amp battery to make sure the igniter's light is demonstrated in my earlier video. Well, let's see, as far as the cameras go, I'm using my Blade 350 quadcopter with the Mobius cam set for 720p uh, to catch the fast action instead of 1080. I'm also wearing the 1080p X14 AM forehead camera, uh, so I'll get first few shots. I have a Garmin Verb on the ground for the launch, and that's going to be in slow motion. Jeff's going to be using my Canon Elfs, and Sir George is coming, and he's going to be using his long-distance lens to catch it high up. There's also an onboard altimeter with a speed and G recording, so that's going to be really neat to see those parameters. There's also two pencil cameras on the rocket body. One aims up and one aims down.
This clip is clipped to one side of the backup 9 volt metal tab and that goes to the G Motors Quest Igniter. Well, this is the last clip to hook up. It actually hooks up to the other backup 9 volt metal tab and the second lead of the G Motors Quest Igniter. Those tabs then provide 9 volts to the Quest Igniter when the string slack runs out at about 6 to 8 inches providing the backup with the second igniter inside the motor. These two pull-off launch box clips connect to two permanent metal tabs on the rocket here. Those metal tabs are hooked through red and orange wires to the Sonics igniter which is inside the G-motor here. This is done and it will fire immediately along with the other six Sonics. It has an independent circuit because it needs the igniter to stay in until the backup quest igniter fires. These other two 12 volt launch box clips are connected to the six Sonic igniters inside the D12 motors. Well, both the Sonics and the Quest igniters are as far as I can get deep inside the G motor. They're also taped as per the manufacturer's instructions and I even put a little drop of goop there for good measure. I wanted to make sure there was plenty of space around and there was no way anything could be pulled out either getting it out to the launch site or when I'm doing the hookup. One, fire! Well, the launchbox wires have plenty of length to clear the pole and not pull against anything. And as you can clearly see, the wires released when the clips were pulled from the two metal tabs and fell back to earth. This was long after both igniters had lighted near the bottom of the pole anyway and could not interfere with anything. Here you can clearly see the D12 motors lit immediately with the Sonics. You can also see the six Sonics igniters ejecting and the seventh Sonic injector inside the G motor lit but did not ignite the motor. I'm going to show you what I found out here. This is the actual setup and everything is still hooked up the same as it was uh, from the day. I have not unhooked any of these things. So here's the way this works. The main power for my unit comes in. There's four alligator clips here. These two are connected to the sonic igniters that were on the outside D12 motors. Okay, so when I would push the button, all six of those fired, boom. Okay, the other two alligator clips coming from the same place are connected to these two tabs down in, in here. Okay, and they are connected to this wire here, and the other one is over here, and that's connected to the other red wire over here and that is connected to my sonic which was here okay so these six igniters fire and at the same time the, the 12 volts runs into here and right out and that fire that all happened initially but this motor didn't fire secondary feature then is the two 9 volt batteries that uh, Bud has put in here with this sheer with these spring-loaded contact points right there so that 
string is connected with six inches of slop and tied to the base of the launcher. So when the rocket began going up, if the main rocket didn't fire, and this is pretty ingenious, this string would pull out and bingo, that should fire it again. And it did. You can see it's burnt. In fact, it's burning right now. This motor did not work. And as you can see, I had the fuses taped all the way up this distance of the wire inside this motor and Bud's explosive package is still on top of that motor and if you look at this closely you can see that it has been burned the tape has been burned off so and, and by looking at the both rock igniters you can see they both went off By the way, this didn't work. I don't know why, but it didn't work. And also, the accelerometer didn't work because there wasn't enough G's to fire it. So as you can see, everything was done right. Well, you know folks, that night, I spent putting the rocket all back together, figuring a different approach for another launch. But in the morning, I looked at my email and was surprised. I found a very sarcastic bud. You know, the Sonics, all seven of them fired when I pushed the button immediately, but the main engine didn't fire. I mean, there's no way anything could be pulled out because the rocket hasn't even moved yet. But then the rocket did move up about eight inches, and the string pulled, the slack came tight, and the 9-volt tab on the Sonics igniter fired. But again, the G-Motor did not fire. Well, several of my subscribers told me beforehand that the G-Motors don't start up right away. I mentioned that to Bud, but... That's why he designed this backup design on the 9 volts. Still didn't work. Now looking at the motor, it looks like something fired inside the motor and it looks like they were blown out, but it didn't ignite all the way. Again, I never changed the design and these igniters are not pulled out as you saw. In fact, the power went up a good extra 4 feet just in case, but still nothing. Bud's theory, of course, is that it was human error and that I made some last minute change to the ignition system and caused it not to work. The theories from the rocket experts have given me these findings also, all which could have happened. Uh, I've been reprimanded by many saying that I should never put two igniters in one rocket motor as there is no guarantee that the tip of either one of them will touch the explosive. One igniter could act as a heat sink too, decreasing the heat. And number two, the wires melted from the first igniter and shorted the wires, then preventing the second igniter to ignite. Now that could have happened too. And since both igniters show they did work, uh, it may be thermal dynamic interference. That means both ignited in such a manner that they interfered with each other, directing the fire in the wrong direction and blowing the igniters out of the rocket instead of igniting the motor. We believe that scenario would be the best of the three.